So if we're thinking about what an isometry is, it has a lot to do with equal distance, but it doesn't necessarily encompass the definition that all points under an isometry are going to move an equal distance as all other points. Because in this example of a rotation, C has a lot shorter distance to move than B does under this isometry, mainly because C is closer to the center of rotation uh, of this rotation than B is. Um, so it's not that all points are moving an equal distance, but rather what equality of distance do we need here? So we want that an isometry preserves distances. What does that mean? And for example, in the case of this diagram, what does preserving distances translate to? Yeah. So however far apart two points are before we apply an isometry, the images of those points will be the same distance away from one another after we apply the isometry. So it's a transformation which preserves distances. So importantly, because it's a transformation, in particular it's a function, right? Uh, when we think algebraically about functions relating a domain to a range, well, a transformation is the, usually just the geometrical word that we give to functions which operate on some geometric space, like the plane, um, and which usually in a transformation send that uh, into itself. So both the domain and the codomain of, uh, of these transformations, these functions, are the plane, the same, the same thing. Uh, but they, that it preserves distance means that the distance between any two points, let's say P and Q, and the distance between the images of those two points, if I call them P prime and Q prime, that those distances are required to be the same. So in this diagram, for example, the length of the side AB in the pre-image triangle has to agree with the length of the side A prime B prime in the image of that segment under this transformation. Um, and likewise for the other pairs of sides. So any transformation under which the distance between pre-images agrees with the distance between the images is what we'll call an isometry. And just by sketching this particular figure, I think I've given away part of the proof of Theorem 724, which says that congruency of triangles is proven under an isometry. Um, at least in this example, um, the distances between those corresponding um, uh, points is what I'm most concerned about, because that's what defines an isometry. It preserves the distances between points. So in my little chart here, preserving distances is what every isometry will do. Now, we have a variety of different types of isometries that we're going to talk about, but that's the one thing that they all must have in common. That's the cost of membership in the isometry club, is that they all have to preserve distances. So I'm just going to, right off the bat, go in and give these all check marks. Every type of isometry has to preserve distances. Um, but we saw here an example of an isometry that does not satisfy that all points are moving an equal distance. So that's a slightly different statement, right? The distance from C to C prime is not the same here as the distance from B to B prime, for example. So this particular type of isometry does not move all points an equal distance. So I think we can say that a rotation which is one of our main types of isometries, that a rotation does not move all points equal distances. So we can't check off that box. Um, but there are isometries that do. What kind? Translations. translations. So translation is a type of isometry. In fact, it, we would say it's the type of, the type of isometry which preserves, uh, which moves all points equal distances. So if I start with a triangle over here, again, label it ABC, and I apply a translation to it, that's easy to do on a tablet with a copy-paste operation. There we go. So there's a translation, except all that I have to do now is relabel these 
image vertices, a prime, b prime, c prime. Um, and a translation is characterized by that very property, that the distance between a and a prime is equal to the distance between b and b prime, is equal to the distance between c and c prime. And indeed, the distance between any point and its image, p, p prime, for all p, is what makes a translation a translation. Um, there's also some other aspects that the definition of translation in our textbook calls out. Um, what if I draw the line through A and A prime, and the line from C to C prime, for example? We know that those segments, A to A prime and C to C prime, have the same length. But what else is true about those lines? Okay. They're parallel. So that's another fact that makes translation what it is. Um, sometimes geometers call this a parallel transport. Um, it's just we've taken this thing and we've slid it along uh, a pair of parallel lines to move it to a different location. Um, so a translation is one of our bread and butter types of isometries. It has to preserve distances because that's what all isometries do. But unlike rotations, it's characterized by moving all points an equal distance. OK. Um, so that's rotation and translation. Uh, what else do we have in our, in our bag of tricks? What other isometries, what other types of isometries exist? Reflection. All right, let's talk reflection. So my, my agenda here is I want to draw contrasts. In addition to the definitions, I want to contrast between these types of isometries to figure out you know, what gives them their unique character. So in order to reflect a geometric object, I need to choose what geometers call a hyperplane, which in the case of a plane is just a line. I need to choose a line uh, over which to reflect this figure. And then when I do that, try and do this accurately if I can. I don't know if this is so great. Yeah, close enough. Maybe I'll just have to slide this over a little bit. And so then this would be A prime, this would be B prime, this would be C prime. Um, and what is it that makes a reflection tick? What is it that makes it do what it does? Yeah, I got those backwards. Sorry. C prime here, B prime there. There we go. Um, all right, so how could we be sure that this is a reflection? What is it that makes it so? What if I draw the segment from A to A prime? So from a point to its image. Um, and I have my, my line of reflection here, let's call it L. Sometimes it's called the mirror for our reflection. Um, then what relationship has to exist between L, A, and A prime? Okay, so the distance from A to uh, L has to agree with the distance from A prime to L. Because L is a line and A and A prime are points, so I'm going to use this distance notation just to make sure that we're above board, A prime and L. So we have to have congruent segments here and here. So that's one aspect of it. And what's the second? L is a perpendicular bisector. Yeah. Not only does L bisect A, A prime, but also um, has to do so in a perpendicular fashion. And A, A prime is perpendicular to L. Right. Um, so one way of thinking about how a reflection works, and this, you know, hopefully we can begin to tie some of these ideas together, is if we take A and drop a perpendicular to L, for example, we're going to come to this point, let's call it, um, I don't know what we want to call it, alpha, probably not the greatest name, but whatever. Um, so if we drop a perpendicular from A to L, we'll get this point alpha. 
And then to get from A to alpha, we can think of that as though it's a translation. Translation moving the point A to the point alpha. Well, if I apply that translation a second time, same translation that moves us from A to alpha will also move us from alpha to A prime. If I want to reflect myself through the line that's right in front of me, I first need to walk to that line, and I just need to keep going an equal amount, right? Uh, and that's going to get me to my image point. So this is one way in which we can think about, sort of think about building reflection out of translation. The problem is it doesn't quite work exactly that way because the, the translation that moves A to alpha is not going to effectively move C, for example, to where it needs to go because it would move C way too far over if I did this twice, right? Um, but at least this kind of you know, hints at a way that there might be relationships between reflections. Not exactly, but a little bit. Um, okay, so reflection is an isometry. It preserves, um, it preserves all of the distances between points. Um, does, it, does it move all points in equal distance? No. Points that are closer to the mirror are going to move less than points that are further away from the mirror. So back in our chart, if we're thinking about reflections, we have to put a big X in the moving points in equal distance column. It's not going to happen. Um, OK, so in that respect, it looks like rotations and reflections have a lot in common. So what's different between rotations and reflections? What's one way that we could think about differentiating the two of those? One of the ways to think about what's different about these two triangles, ABC and A prime, B prime, C prime, is to try and write out their congruence relation. So to what triangle is ABC congruent? Well, I guess it's congruent to A prime, B prime, C prime. But the issue is, in the triangle on the left, that labeling of vertices takes us around a counterclockwise circle, ABC. Right? Whereas A prime, B prime, C prime, in the triangle on the right, takes us around a clockwise circle. Right? So that notion of orientation has changed. Um, another way to, to say this, and this is how our, our author uh, says it, but it's a topic that we haven't had the luxury of, of dwelling on. Um, if I look at the line segment from A to B, not as a segment, but as a directed segment. So to do that, we give it a little direction, like a little vector, an arrow that points from A to B. And then I look at the segment from A prime to B prime. It's somehow going in an opposite um, Well, it may or may not, I guess. Maybe A and B were the wrong ones to choose here. If I want to illustrate this point better, I should probably choose B and C instead. Just to make it clear what it is that I'm trying to, the distinction I'm trying to draw. So here, the directed distance from B to C and the directed distance from B prime to C prime are somehow going in opposite directions. So we've changed some directionality around. And that's responsible for the change in orientation that we see with a, uh, a reflection. So one of the ways we can say that is we can ask whether an isometry preserves directed distance. And not every isometry does preserve directed distance because reflections don't. Right? We change the direction of the line segment when we reflect it across, uh, across some hyperplane. Um, so now we have a new category a new dimension in which we can differentiate between isometries. Um, so let's look at how the other isometries stack up. Um, do rotations preserve directed distance? Or another way to say it, do they preserve orientation, clockwiseness, handedness? If I rotate my right hand, it's, right still, hand. it's still a right hand, yeah. So rotations are totally fine as far as preserving directed distances and preserving handedness and orientation as a result. So rotations, yes. How about translations? If I move my right hand, just slide it somewhere else, yeah, it preserves directed distance as well. Um, so now we have kind of a sufficient, well, almost a sufficient set of differentiators uh, for our different kinds of isometries. Um, they all preserve distances because that's the definition 
of isometries. Among them, only one dis might not preserve directed distance, the reflections, um, and only one of them satisfies that all points are moving an equal amount of distance. Those are the translations. What, is, what do you mean by dilation? Wouldn't that change the distance? Yeah, I think so, so too. Right, so, well, let's, but I want to talk about this, because this is, you know, this will help to underscore what it is that makes isometry special. So, say I start with this triangle, and then I, let's say I just blow it up like this, right? Stretch it so that all of the distances in my figure here have changed by an equal ratio. Right, so maybe I doubled all of my distances to go from the figure on the left to the figure on the right, times two. So this is not an isometry because it's not preserving distances. Preserving really means equal on the nose. right? Um, it does, however, set up an equiproportionality of the type that we talk about in chapter three. So the distance from A prime to B prime is the same ratio bigger than the distance from A to B as the ratio of B prime to C prime is to the distance from B to C, and likewise A prime C prime to AC. And that's two or whatever, if I'm using two as my scale factor here. Um, so the distances are changing, which makes this not an isometry. But I want to put it on this list anyway. Because even though it fails on that count, a dilation, not an isometry, because it doesn't preserve distances in general, unless the scale factor is equal to 1, which would make it a pretty boring dilation. Um, but what does it, in fact, prove? Uh, sorry, what does it, in fact, preserve? What's the same about these two figures? Directed, well, directed distance is still, the direction is still the same. Um, but the distance, not necessarily, right? The distances are definitely different. So, uh, yeah, I think that if we only changed the direction but not the distance, there we'd be talking about a reflection again. Um, but if we change just the distance and not the direction, it still doesn't preserve directed distance, per se. So I'm going to put an X in that column. Um, are all points here moving an equal distance? Yeah. Well, yeah. Hmm. So I've been sort of loose here about um, what is the center of our dilation. I should probably try to be uh, more careful about that. Um, let's suppose that I make the center of my dilation B. So I'm going to put my new figure right on top of my old figure over here at you know, place it at B. Um, so that means that B has moved a distance of nothing, but A and C both move a non-zero amount of distance. So it looks like a dilation doesn't necessarily preserve um, the, that all points move an equal distance. Excellent question. Right. So it's entirely possible that depending on where we place the center of our dilation, and depending on what points are being dilated, that we might move a certain set of points in equal distance. For example, let's say I have a square, and I choose the center of that square as the center of my dilation. And then I'm going to dilate all of my points, A, B, C, D. I'm going to dilate them all out by a factor of 2, let's say. Then that's just the same as saying, well, I'm just going to go from the center of my dilation out to D, and then again, twice as far, and that will get me to my image point, D prime. And likewise for all the other points. And what we end up with is this dilated square, A prime, B prime, C prime. And it will be the case for this particular square that all of my points have moved by equal distances. Um, so the distance from A to A prime is the same as the distance from B to B prime, C to C prime, and D to D prime. But 
I'm going to dig in my heels and say that it's still not true that all points are moving in equal distance. Why not? Give me an example of a point on this figure that under this dilation is not going to move the same distance as A, B, C, and D. What distance does O move under this dilation? It's not going to move at all. Right. So A, B, C, and D are all moving. O is not. So we can't conclude that all points are moving in equal distance. And that's another thing about isometry. We often think about isometries and, and other transformations as just selectively acting on a figure. In fact, they act on the entire plane. So even points that aren't part of our figure that we're actively trying to transform are also getting transformed. It's like taking your whole sheet of graph paper and stretching it or, or rotating it or shifting it or relocating it or doing something with it, right? Um, everything gets moved when a transformation acts. Um, and so even, even a dilation which seems to move all the points on a, on a figure an equal amount of distance um, uh, doesn't move all points in the plane an equal amount of distance. But what does it preserve? What is, in fact, the same about these two triangles? based on the equiproportionality of all their sides, and indeed the equiproportionality under a dilation of any pair of points between pre-image and image. What are we preserving? Angles. We're preserving angles. And that we would know from chapter three, um, because in chapter three we had the SSS criterion uh, for, the, with the lowercase s's, um, criterion for similarity of triangles, which was enough to guarantee if I have equiproportionality of the sides of a pair of triangles, that I also get congruence of the angles, congruence of the corresponding angles in that triangle. So even though a dilation fails on all three of these possible counts to be an isometry, it does still preserve angles. And one of the things that we'll be looking at today is how isometries stack up against that uh, that requirement. Do isometries preserve angles? Suppose that we rotate this triangle through an angle of theta. Have I preserved the angles in that triangle? Yeah. If I translate, yeah, we've preserved angles. If I reflect, certainly. So that's one of the neat, what mathematicians call dualities in, in geometry is that Often what happens to distances also happens to angles, but not always, right? Um, in isometry, we'll be able to show, this is again theorem 724, that because it preserves distances, it must also preserve angles. Um, but that's a one-way street. Right? We cannot conclude that a transformation which preserves angles also preserves distances, because dilations don't. They do one of them, but not the other. But isometries, because they preserve distances, they also preserve angles, which means Distance preservation is the stronger condition. Right? That's the keys to the kingdom here. And that's why we study isometry, because they give us a lot to work with.